Good afternoon, welcome back. So this is what rain does. It decreases attendance, right? You know, in my old my day, I walked 30 miles uphill in the yeah. snow. <laughs> both, ways. <laughs> both ways uphill. <laughs> yes. uh, today we're going to talk about adaptive immunity. So we have two lectures on immunology, which is very short. Immunology is an amazing subject, but we have to we have to talk about viruses in this course. But we need to know enough immunity to understand how viruses cause disease, because the majority of disease caused by viruses is the immune response. So today, adaptive immunity. Uh, to remind you what I'm talking about, we talked about intrinsic and innate last time. Intrinsic, always present in the cell. <coughs> Apoptosis, autophagy, RNA silencing, antiviral proteins. And we're just chatting with a student here. You know, sometimes it's hard to figure out what these mean because innate is induced by infection, but there are always macrophages and dendritic cells and NK cells around, right? So, you know, the nomenclature is just something that we do. It's not perfect. Uh, so, but, you know, macrophages and, and uh, dendritic cells and NK cells, their numbers can go up in infection. So maybe that's why it's part of the innate immune system. I mean, I had big arguments with this about my textbook with my textbook colleagues, you know, uh, they say that interferon is an intrinsic defense, but I think it's an innate defense, but interferon is always present, so I gave up. So don't worry about nomenclature. Just, I just show you what the field says. I want you to understand the concepts. Innate induced by infection, and finally, the adaptive is tailored to the pathogen. Innate can inhibit pretty much anything, but the adaptive is tailored, antibodies and T cells are tailored to the pathogen, as you'll see today, and there's memory, there is immune memory, which is, has classically not been considered to be a feature of innate immunity, but we're starting to think that it might be, you know, these things are meant to be broken down, that's how science works. So to remind you where we left off last time, we have an epithelial cell sheet, which is infected by a virus, the cells sense the virus infection. They produce cytokines and chemokines. They attract sentinel cells like dendritic cells that are shown here. The cytokines attract the dendritic cells and then contribute to them being activated. Then the dendritic cells pick up maybe apoptotic bodies or virus particles or pieces of dead and dying cells and they process them, get activated, which you can see now they look like a dendritic cell, they're mature. They move into the lymph node and there they present whatever they've picked up to T cells. And then if what they have is foreign, that is it's recognized by a T cell. Because again, the assumption is all the self-recognizing T cells are gone. If that they activate some T cell, then you make antibodies and uh, cytotoxic T lymphocytes, which are part of the antiviral repertoire and those uh, go into the circulation and reach different tissues. All right, so today we're gonna explore how that happens. It's really an amazing process. First of all, the participants are leukocytes and lymphocytes. A leukocyte is a general term for a white blood cell, and this would include lymphocytes, neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils, macrophages, you can see picture drawings of them there. Leu lymphocytes are a subset of leukocytes. They include T cells, B cells, and K cells. They're distinguished because they have variable antigen detecting cell surface receptors. The other cells do not. So we call those lymphocytes. So that's what we mean when we talk about leukocytes and lymphocytes. What white blood cell is also synonymous with leukocyte. And here are how these cells develop. They all begin with a hematopoietic stem cell, typically in the bone marrow which can give rise to everything. It's multi-potential because it can give rise to all of these different cells. It's quite remarkable. And that's self-renewing as well, as you can see by the arrow going around. They can divide and make more of themselves, very important cells. And they initially become two different progenitors, a common myeloid progenitor, the progenitor to all of the myeloid lineage, which includes basophils, neutrophils, eosinophils, and macrophages that we just talked about. And on the other side, the common lymphoid progenitor, which is gonna give rise to NK cells, B cells, and T cells. 
And the B cells, in addition, give rise to, to plasma cells, which are big factories for making uh, antibodies. So this is where they work. This is where they come from. And during an infection, you need more of these. So signals go into the bone marrow to make more of these cell types, to differentiate and make more of them. And yet, and last time we also talked about the activation of, a, of an dendritic cell, but let's uh, review it. So dendritic cells, immature dendritic cells are great toolboxes. They have all kinds of receptors. They have toll-like receptors on their surfaces. They have receptors for cytokines. They have, um, they have, they're phagocytic. They can take up almost anything, including viruses. As you can see, virus proteins, they can take up apoptotic bodies, parts of dead and dying cells. They can make interferon, which would try and clear the infection when they first move to the infected area. They have class one, they have class two in them, class two MHC, major histocompatibility complex, cell surface molecules that present antigen. On the APC, it's class two. So class two is mainly found on mature dendritic cells on the surface, on macrophages and B lymphocytes. And class one is on every other cell in your body and they have distinct roles. Class two is, is involved in antigen presentation to T cells in the lymph node. So when a, uh, a dendritic cell senses, picks up say antigens in all these ways, it, be, it, it becomes activated. The MHC molecules move to the surface and they carry with them viral peptides or any peptide actually that they have picked up. Uh, and then they migrate into the lymph node and encounter a naive T cell. And the T cell has a T cell receptor which binds the, the peptide within the context of the MHC class two. And if there is a T cell in you that recognizes the peptide presented by the dendritic cell, the T cell will become activated. The point is, is that anything that activates a T cell should be foreign because all the self T cells are gone. But in, in reality, we have many autoimmune diseases where people still make uh, reactions to their own self. That's a problem and causes uh, pathogenesis, of course. But if that's a foreign peptide, the T cell becomes activated and then does its thing, which we will talk about today. So this, the antigen, the, the dendritic cell picking up a foreign antigen, that's called the exogenous antigen presentation pathway because it's taking something from the exterior, bringing it into the cell, processing it, and then putting it back on the cell surface in MHC. And that's in contrast to the, to the endogenous pathway, which is we'll see in a moment, which happens when a virus infects the cell and it makes proteins in the cell and they're processed in similar ways. So this is exogenous presentation. It's gonna go up on the, these peptides are gonna go on the surface in the context of MHC2 because this is a antigen presenting cell. So here we have a protein being endocytosed. It goes into the endocytic pathway. So that could be a protein released from a cell. It could be a virus particle. It could be an apoptotic body. But eventually uh, this um, protein is degraded in the endocytic pathway by proteases. And those little orange bits are peptides. And they are loaded onto the MHC class two molecule, which, which is brought to that late vesicle. Uh, and then you can see the MHC class two with the peptide, which is always orange rectangles in these images. Uh, that goes to the cell surface. The vesicle fuses with the plasma membrane. And now we have MHC two with a peptide on the surface. That is then gonna be presented to a T cell. This very funny looking cell here, which is just a slice of a T cell, right? The whole T cell is here. That has a T cell receptor on its surface, which engages the peptide, but only when the peptide is in MHC2, not by itself. And a CD4 molecule, uh, that's a T helper cell. That's a CD4 molecule, which also senses the MHC. So that's the exogenous pathway. So this is the dendritic cell picking up antigen and presenting a peptide derived from it in the lymph node. So it has to migrate from the infected area to the lymph node, obviously. That's what lymph capillaries are for. Now, some viruses do interfere with this pathway. Not a lot, because you have to infect the sentinels. You have to infect the dendritic cells, macrophages, and so forth. So not a lot of examples of that, but uh, human cytomegalovirus does infect these cells, and it interferes with transcription of MHC2. So you can imagine that that blocks antigen presentation and therefore the T cells are not gonna be activated. And that's in fact the outcome that um, 
these viruses establish persistent infections because they can't be cleared, which would normally be the job of the T cell. These sentinels are everywhere in you. If you, if you concentrate really hard, you can feel them, okay? No, I'm just kidding. There are a lot of them though. There are billions and billions to quote Carl Sagan. Um, and here are just two examples. There's the mucosal immune system and the cutaneous, right? Your uh, mucosal surfaces that have epithelial cells. Here are, here's a, the lumen of the intestine and the subepithelial tissues. There are M cells throughout this epithel epithelial barrier. And those are two M cells. There's those specialized in endocytosing antigen from the lumen, bringing it down to the bottom, and then it can be picked up by antigen presenting cells to see if you've got anything foreign in your gut. I'm just thinking of some weird food you eat, you know, and you get an allergic reaction. That's something you've never eaten before, but more likely it's pathogens. So antigen presenting cells, and then those pick it up in the way we've just described and can go to the lymph nodes and bring it to, uh, to the lymph vessels and bring it to the lymph node. And we have the same thing in our skin. Here's, here's the cross section of skin. Here's our outer dead layer of skin. Uh, here is the living cells below it, the epidermis, and then below, here's a blood vessel. And we have cells migrating throughout the skin. That, just that thin layer all around you has keratinocytes and mobile Langerhans dendritic cells, all of which will pick up um, antigens and present them to T cells in the lymph node. We call these specific things GALT, gut associated lymphoid tissue. So the M cells are part of GALT and MALT, mucosa associated lymphoid tissues. When, um, when a T cell gets activated by recognizing its cognate peptide, and every T cell recognizes a different peptide, for example, one in 10,000 to 100,000 B or T cells recognize any antigen that you can take up. It's amazing. You can make a chemical, a synthetic chemical antigen, and there's somewhere in you a T cell that will recognize it or a B cell. It's just amazing. And uh, once that T cell recognizes it, the T cell begins, it becomes activated and it begins to proliferate and make more of that specific T cell that recognizes that one peptide because it's all, every T cell is specific, has a slightly different T cell receptor on the surface that recognizes just one peptide, foreign peptide. And so those T cells have to become amplified so they can do their job, right? And within one to two weeks, they can be as much as 50,000 fold amplified. And that's why you get swollen lymph nodes, lymph lymphadenopathy. Your lymph nodes, of course, are throughout the body, as you can see in that person there. Uh, but some of them are on the surface, like right underneath your neck, you've got two on either side that are very prominent. When you get an upper tract infection, you can feel them swelling. That's how you can tell if you have a cold or not. They get pretty big because the T cells are multiplying. That's next time you get a cold, you can say, wow, this is things happening in me. It's very cool. So that's lymphadenopathy. And there's a lymph node which shows you all the different parts of it. Of course, there are lymph vessels that come in, they bring the sentinels in. The lymph system is always draining your tissues to sample it for antigens. It's constantly happening. And those sampled tissue, those fluids go into the lymph node. They, then they're, they're bringing either antigens to interact with B cells, as we'll see later, or the the antigen presenting cells to interact with T cells. You can see there are different B and T cell areas of the lymph node. And then um, if you make antibodies, they can go out via the blood vessels, the uh, arteries and the vein there. So that's how you get this communication between uh, the lymph node and the rest of you. If you make antibodies or T cells, they come out of the lymph nodes and then they get in the circulation and they can go everywhere, but they will go to where the infection is as well. So our first question, what is a property of innate instruction of adaptive immunity? A presentation of viral peptides on MHC2 to CD4 T cells, endocytosis of viral proteins, activation of dendritic cells by cytokines, sensing by TIL-like receptors, all of the above. Okay, how do we do? So the answer is all of the above. A lot of you got that. Many of you said presentation of peptides 
on MHC2 to CD4. That's absolutely right, but it's also endocytosis activation sensing. So I'll show you the slide just to reinforce that. What would be the best slide? Okay, let's take a look at this. Uh, we have, so there's an immature dendritic cell. So it's gonna be activated and present peptides on class two on the right. That's absolutely right. That's what some of you answered, but they're also, they have toll-like receptors on their surface, so they're sensing viral protein. They, what was the other answer? I don't even remember. They, well, they, they endocytose viral proteins. That's on, on that too. So dead and dying cells, that could be viral proteins as well. And uh, activation by cytokines, right? Look at those little dots uh, coming towards the immature dendritic cell, those are cytokines that are participating in the activation and sensing by TLRs. I showed you the TLR, so that's why it's all of the above. So let's talk about antibodies and B cells. It's a little complicated slide, but it's it, because it tries to summarize everything at once. So let's go through it. So uh, as I said, the B and the T cells uh, originate in the bone marrow from that multipotent hematopoietic precursor, and then, uh, and then and they originate in the T cells, sorry. The T cells originate there, uh, and um, you know they're mostly from the long bones, your arms and legs, and as you age, the marrow disappears in those long bones. So I am a shell of my former self. I have very little marrow <laughs> in my long bones. And that's a problem because it's hard to make new T cell responses. You still have some memory from previous infection, but it's hard to make new one. There's nothing you can do about it because you're not supposed to live so long, right? You're supposed to reproduce and boom, that's it. You're done for the earth. But humanity has figured out how to make us live long. So <laughs> the consequence is we have issues. <coughs> you know, maybe Jeff Bezos will solve it and make everyone live forever. Um, anyway, the T cells originate in the bone marrow and then they go to the thymus to mature in a process that we're not going to talk about. But in the thymus, they actually are wiped out if they recognize self, right? The little education for T cells that takes place in the thymus. If you have a T cell that recognizes a self-peptide, they're killed. And what they do in the thymus, every possible protein in the human body is made and put there and chopped up and presented to get rid of all those T cells. It's just totally remarkable. So that gives you your T cells. And there are two kinds of T cells. We're gonna talk about helper T cells, TH, and precursors to cytotoxic T cells. And they have different molecules on their surface. One has CD4 and one has CD8. And then those T cells in the lymph node are gonna be presented the peptides on dendritic cells in the process that we just talked about. On, on the bottom right, here's a panel of what's happening to these two kinds of T cells. So in the lymph node, we activate a T cell, it's gonna, here's the T cell receptor. It's gonna bind an antigen presenting cell, MHC2 with a peptide. And if it's foreign, if it's recognized, the T cell becomes activated and it begins to proliferate. Your lymph nodes swell. They make a lot of cytokines and they make what are called Th1 and 2. There are other kinds also, but Th1 cytokines help to mature the cytotoxic T cells, which are gonna kill virus infected cells. And we'll talk about that specifically in a moment. These T helper cells also make Th2 cytokines, which help B cells to mature and make a lot of antibodies. So that's why they're called helper cells, because they assist in the development of cytotoxic T lymphocytes or plasma cells. Now, the B cells are shown separately there. This says B cells here. This, these B cells have on their surface one antibody only, that, not, not one, but multiple copies of a single specificity. Every B cell only recognizes one uh, epitope or antigen. And so that particular B cell is bound to a virus particle or a virus protein, and that activates the production of antibodies, which we'll get to in a moment. But then th that B cell can become a plasma cell that makes lots and lots of antibodies, and those antibodies can bind virus particles and help to clear or prevent an infection. Okay, so the, the helper cells are involved in making cytotoxic T lymphocytes and in making, um, uh, B cells mature as well. And then finally, on the, on the very left, we have what's happening in a B cell to get antibodies made. So on the top left, there's a B cell, and on its surface, are what are called B cell receptors, they're basically antibody molecules that are bound in the plasma membrane. 
And again, every B cell makes just one specificity, can bind only one kind of antigen. And you can see there's an antigen uh, binding the antibody on the surface of the B cell. So it's gonna activate that B cell to make antibodies. It needs help in the form of T helper cells here, right? And the way the helper cell works, which is kind of shown vaguely here by cytokines, but the T helper cell also needs to bind to the B cell. Again, the B cell is gonna have presented this, uh, this peptide on MHC2. Remember, B cells are one of the few cell types that have MHC2. So the, the antigen is, sent, is bound by the B cell. It's endocytosed, it's chopped up, presented on MHC2. The T helper cell recognizes that antigen in the context of M MHC2. And then uh, the T cell makes cytokines that help the B cell mature into plasma cells to make antibodies. So this, you know, this burst of cytokines depends on having this interaction to have a B cell recognize the receptor. The T cell is not going to make an uh, B cells differentiate if there's no antigen around. And these antigens, the B cells, of course, are in the lymph nodes along with the T cell, and the antigens are flowing through, aside from dendritic cells bringing antigens into the lymph node to T cells, the antigens themselves are flowing from the tissue through the lymph, into the lymph nodes, and, it, and the B cells there will bind them. And there's always gonna be a B cell that recognizes whatever it is that you're taking up. It's really remarkable. It's local, of course. It's why you have lymph nodes throughout your body, because you could have an infection anywhere. And so if you have an upper tract infection, the lymph nodes up there will be draining that area and picking up whatever virus particles are present. So let's talk about these constituents now in terms of what they do. Here are antibodies. Antibodies are large proteins that are made by B cells that bind antigens. And that's part of the antiviral effect. Here's the structure of an antibody. Two heavy chains and two light chains they have a lot of disulfide bonds, as you can see. But the, it looks like a Y, and the upper part of the Y binds the antigen, and the bottom part of the Y is more constant, and that can bind receptors on various cells. But the top parts, those variable and hypervariable regions, they bind uh, the antigen. And when you inject antigen into an animal, it is, it is sensed by, it is taken up by APCs, like dendritic cells. You get T cells activated, then they collaborate with the B cells when the B cells then recognize the antigen to make antibodies. And so if, here's on the right an experiment where we take an animal, we inject uh, an antigen A, and then we look at serum antibody titer over weeks. And you see after two to three weeks, you have an antibody response against antigen A. So it takes a couple of weeks to get that antigen response. When you get a vaccine, it doesn't protect you on day one. Remember that, <laughs> it takes a couple of weeks. So people say, I got the flu vaccine, then I got flu. Well, you, get, you can get flu in those two weeks until you're protected. No problem, because people use that as an excuse not to get flu vaccines, right? All you have to do is take this course and then you'll know. Uh, so there's the A response. And you know what? You get high levels of antibodies and eventually they go down because you can't keep high levels of any, every antibody that you've ever made. You would be like jello, right? Because you encounter millions of antigens in your lifetime. You can't keep high levels in the blood. They always have to go down. It's the physiological outcome. And they go down and they maintain at a low level, which is uh, indi indicative of there being memory B cells, which we'll get to later. Now let's say weeks later, here, seven weeks later, we inject antigen A plus another antigen. All of a sudden, you get very rapidly, within a few days, you get a big anti-A response, bigger than the primary. And that is a memory response. So all those B cells that have proliferated that are specific for whatever the antigen you put in, they immediately proliferate. You don't have to go through making them over again. That makes sense, because now you can be protected against disease. So, and then, of course, B is a new antigen, so then you have this, the same primary anti-B response, which is delayed. So during the pandemic, nobody understood this. Nobody understood this. They didn't understand that after you, when everybody got vaccinated for COVID in 2020, right? It was great protection. And then suddenly people started getting infected again. In the press, the headline said, vaccines fail. No, they don't fail. 
You failed at understanding immunology because antibodies always go down and you always get infected, but you have a memory response that protects you from severe disease. It takes a couple of days to get that response. So yeah, you're gonna get infected. If you could block infection totally, and that would be called sterilizing immunity, an unfortunate term, but that's the term. Well, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, we can't, you can't do it, it doesn't exist, because you always have this lag. And so the press declared that the vaccines had failed and gave people a lot of less confidence in vaccine just from not understanding the immunology of, of an immune response, a simple uh, picture like this. And I was talking to Paul Offit today, who's a vaccine expert at UPenn. He said, you know, the immunologist failed in communicating this. When the press started saying that, they should have intervened and said, no, this is the way the immune response works. So if you get a vaccine, you can be protected against, other than a mild disease for, you know, a couple of weeks, four, four weeks, four weeks to six weeks, depending on the, the uh, antigen. But then the levels are going to go low and you're going to get infected when you have that, that second, that infection again, and then you're going to have a, a big response later. So the press called it waning immunity. This is no good. Don't use that word. That's, that sounds bad, right? Waning sounds like something's not working. It's contraction of the antibody level. All right, so here are the terms I've been throwing out and I didn't define for you. So an, an antigen, did you have a question? Yeah. The question is, how does this relate to flu vaccines where you report F effectiveness? So in the real world, it's called effectiveness. When you do a vaccine trial, it's efficacy, it's different. Okay, how does this relate? So uh, first of all, you have to always define what you're measuring as effectiveness. It could be infection, it could be mild disease, severe disease, it could be hospitalization, it could be going to the ICU, it could be doing intubation, it could be anything or any combination thereof, right? So for the flu vaccine, they often will, will estimate infection or mild disease. And the problem with the flu vaccine is first, the vaccine isn't very good. And secondly, the virus changes every year, which makes it even worse. So it's hard to measure. And, and so on a year where they match the vaccine with the, with the virus very well, it's quite protective for the three months of the flu season. The problem is if you go get your vaccine in August, which the senior citizens tend to do, right? Because the CVS is all set, get your flu vaccine. Then by December, your immunity has gone. And the flu season is really big in January and February. So that's, the vaccine needs to be improved. That's the bottom line. Did I answer your question? How, what, two days later? No, no, like six weeks later. <laughs> How bad a flu did you get? Oh, it was pretty bad. Did you die? <laughs> it saved your life. It saved, that's what my clinician friend says, it saved your life. So don't complain. If you hadn't gotten it, it could have been worse. Okay. Yes, you can get flu. I mean, maybe you don't respond well to vaccines. You know, everybody responds differently, blah, blah, blah. So. But really, I agree, the vaccine is not great. Yeah, okay. You get maybe 50 to 60% protection against severe disease and hospitalization, and it should be higher. All right, so an antigen is the molecule that induces the immune response in, in terms of antibodies or T cells. It can be a protein, it can be DNA, it can be RNA, it could be a lipid, it could be a polysaccharide, some chemical that you make in the laboratory. An epitope is the part of the antigen that is bound by the antibody or the T cell receptor. And the, so you imagine a long protein, right? Each of these blue balls is an amino acid. So that's the antigen, all of the whole protein. And then the epitope is in red here. It's the part that binds the antibody in the antigen combining site. So that's, that's the epitope. Uh, and we, we define epitopes as linear, where there's simply a, a linear sequence of amino acids that are binding, and sometimes conformational, where the um, binding is in two distant parts of the protein. Uh, a monoclonal antibody is against one epitope, one amino acid sequence. And your serum contains a mixture of those, we call serum polyclonal, because when you inject a protein into an animal, they make antibodies against many different epitopes in the protein, not just one. Now, the amazing part of making antibodies is how, how can we recognize so many different proteins, even proteins or chemicals we haven't seen before. And that's because uh, in our germline, 
you have encoded parts of antibody molecules, which are shown at the top, the germline configuration, you have what are called V segments, D segments, J segments, <coughs> constant regions. And these are all shuffled in different combination to make different antibodies. And so you see there D, D to J recombination, V to DJ recombination, and all those repeated boxes are, are different and they can be recombined in different combinations. And so that alone will give you three times 10 to the 11th uh, combinations of a single antibody. So you can imagine that you get a great diversity from that. And then from that gene that undergoes all that recombination, you have uh, an mRNA made that's translated to make your antibody molecule. So that's your initial response. The, the viral proteins flowing through your lymph node encounter a B cell with the right antibody on the surface that's already been made in you by this VDJ recombination. It makes so many different combinations, 10 to the 11th, that among them, there's, there's something that recognizes whatever is flowing through you. It's just a huge number. However, that's not the end of it. We have to make even better antibodies because many of these don't work well. They have poor affinity. So we have to undergo what we call affinity maturation in the lymph node in a special place called uh, the germinal center. So now we've, we've made antibodies uh, we've made B cells that are specific for one peptide, let's say, and they've expanded. And they're shown here on the upper the left. We have uh, ant B cells with low affinity uh, antibodies on their surface because when they're first made, they're not really great affinity. Uh, and if they're too low in the lymph node, when an antigen binds them, um, you don't get interaction with the T helper cell and that cell dies. So here, this cell is put to death by apoptosis because this antigen is so low affinity that it can't cross-link the, the antibodies on the surface of the B cell and it cannot present that antigen to a T helper cell, right? So that cell dies. So all the low affinity B cells, that is all the B cells making low affinity antibody are gotten rid of after you've made that initial burst of B cells. But there are some randomly, uh, some B cells made with antibodies of high affinity on their surface the antigen will cross-link those antibodies and uh, they will engage a T helper cell, which will then help that B cell to uh, proliferate and um, make, make plasma cells as well. So the high affinity um, antibodies are selected in that way. And we can make up to 10 to the 11th different antibodies, as I told you before, and we can make high affinity versions of them. Now, um, in addition to this, there are enzymes in the B cell that mutate the DNA encoding the antibody so you can make even more different combinations of antibodies. It's called somatic hypermutation. So the DNA gets mutated, the antibodies are made from those mutated DNAs by, through mRNA, of course. And then they go through this uh, education again. If they're low affinity, they get eliminated. If they're high affinity, they get selected for. So over the course of seeing an antigen, you'll make initially a mix of antibodies, then higher and higher and higher affinity antibodies. And often that's what a boost in a vaccine is to try and promote the making of high affinity antibodies. Because those bind antigen really well and they, they work very well. So there are many different kinds of antibodies that we make, they're shown here. We have uh, IgA, we have IgD, E, G, and M. Uh, for viruses, we mainly talk about IgA, which is mucosal, <laughs> can be serum or mucosal. Uh, IgG, which is your major systemic antibody, and IgM, which is the first antibody that is made. IgM uh, is typically low affinity stuff for reasons I just told you. And so what it does is it, it all the FC portions uh, are combined together, one, two, three, four, five. So even though it's low affinity, it has higher avidity because you have five of the antibodies instead of just one. And then these are gradually replaced with IgG, as we do affinity maturation. So if you look at the course of uh, antibody production during and after immunization here, you see this is, um, here's antibody against poliovirus. And you can see that uh, we immunize the animal and then the IgGM, IgM in purple goes up first and followed by IgG. And then eventually the IgM goes down. You don't need it anymore because it's replaced by high affinity IgG. And IgA also goes up a bit later. And IgA can be 
in a circulation, excuse me, or it can be also in your mucosal surfaces. Secretory IgA is produced by plasma cells that underlie epithelial surfaces. So this could be your upper respiratory tract or your GI tract. You have plasma cells below here that are producing uh, a specific kind of antibody called polymeric IgA, which is a dimer. It binds to a polymeric IgA receptor on the basal lateral surface of these cells. It gets transported by transatosis to the apical layer. It's released uh, and then proteases cleave um, off the antibody which gets stuck on the surface so that it can be free. And there in the mucosa, it can directly bind with viruses and, and bacteria. Now, some of the antibodies, we make antibodies against the virus of all kinds. Some of them can block infection. So we call these neutralizing antibodies. Not all virus antibodies will block infection. They will bind the virus, but they won't block infection. Uh, some of them actually block infectivity and they can say neutralize virus in the blood if the virus has a viremic stage, or they can neutralize virus at mucosal surfaces, so IgA and IgG can go onto your mucosa and block viruses as they're infecting you. And um, some actually bind without neutralizing but can lead to virus destruction, as I'll show you in a moment. Now, the focus of antibodies is on neutralizing antibodies that block infection, but it turns out that there are many more antibodies that are made that don't neutralize, but they also play an important role. Um, we generally think that antibodies are important for inhibiting the initial infection. So you get infected, and if you've been vaccinated, you have a memory response in a few days, and after a little bit of replication, those antibodies are made, they then reduce replication, so they reduce spread and they re reduce disease. So we think the antibodies work earlier on, although there's some cases where uh, antibodies are also important for recovering from an infection. And as I said, not all antiviral antibodies can neutralize infection. So what do I mean by neutralize? So here is the way you measure neutralizing antibodies. It's a plaque assay. You remember that from last time. A plaque assay, you measure infectious particles, you make dilutions of virus, and you put them on a plate of cells and you count plaques. So to look for neutralizing antibodies, you would make a dilution of virus that gives a countable number of plaques. What do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 plaques. Yeah, I got it written below it, come on. Um, so we have made a dilution that gives you 11 plaques, and then you, make, you mix that virus with dilutions of sera. So I take serum from you, I wanna know if you have antibodies to a virus. You mix the virus and the serum dilutions, and then you do a plaque assay. And here on the top, we have mixed with different dilutions of serum, one to 10, one to 100,000, one to 10,000. And on the bottom, we have, say, serum from a person or an animal that wasn't injected with the virus or immunized with it. And you can see there's no inhibition of plaque formation, but here at the lowest dilution, no plaques, one to 100, no plaques, one to 1,000, two plaques. So you can see there's antibody, neutralizing antibody in this serum that's blocking infection. And we can calculate it tighter. You may have seen during COVID, people were talking about, I have a 140 tighter in my antibodies. Well, that means that 140 is the dilution where you neutralize 50% of the plaques, basically. That's the way it should be. So here, uh, and antibodies will prevent disease in many cases. So for example, here are, here's an experiment where we have taken an animal and injected it with polio virus, which will paralyze the animal. And we, we are measuring on the y-axis percent animals paralyzed. So we give the animals just virus, and you can see almost 100% of them are paralyzed. And then we give uh, antibodies from uh, the, the least concentrated to the most concentrated. And so you see, as you give more and more antibodies along with the inoculum, you're preventing paralysis. So the antibodies have the ability to prevent disease, the neutralizing antibodies. And during COVID, many antibody therapies were used before we had vaccines. So we had on the left, we would take people who had recovered from COVID, we would take their serum and uh, give it to other people if, who had COVID and try and prevent uh, infection. So serum is the liquid that remains after the uh, 
the blood uh, has been clotted. It's actually convalescent plasma therapy, which is the liquid that remains when the cells are removed and clotting is prevented with an anticoagulant. So this was used early in the pandemic. Um, it's no longer used except in individuals who can't mount a vaccine response like immunocompromised people. And we also made monoclonal antibodies early in the pandemic. These are just two of them, two different names against different epitopes on the spike protein. And these would be infused into people to try. You could either use them prophylactically, you could give it to someone and it would protect them for three months, or you could give it to someone who is early in the infection. So we can use uh, antibodies to treat prevent or treat diseases. Now, how do the antibodies block infection? Um, at least for, for SARS-CoV-2, most of them block attachment of virus to the receptor. So here, this is a different virus as an example, but here's a virus where the antibody is binding the virus particle and it blocks attachment because the antibody is sitting in the part of the virus that attaches to the cellular receptor. But there are other ways that antibodies can neutralize. They can cause aggregation of particles. They can block encoding. They can actually block either endocytosis or encoding. They can even block uh, infection once the particle is in the cytoplasm. But the main, the main way is, at least for some viruses, is by blocking attachment. And so the places where antibody bind, antibodies bind on virus particles are called neutralization antigenic sites, all right? Um, and here's an example for polio virus. Uh, there's a structure of the, the particle on the left, and in white are the parts of the virus that bind antibodies, the neutralization antigenic sites. You can see uh, they're repeated because of the symmetry of the particle. Here's the five-fold axis, and there are one, two, three, four, five copies of that particular, particular epitope around the five-fold axis. On the right is an example of, of neutralization antigenic sites on the influenza virus hemagglutinin. Remember, that's the spike protein in the virus particle. And here's the tip and here's the membrane part. And all these different colored regions are places where antibodies bind and neutralize infectivity. You can also map antibodies that bind and don't neutralize. But what we have here are the neutralization antigenic sites, which means those sites give rise to antibodies that block infection. You do the same thing with SARS-CoV-2. Here's the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. It's a trimer. And all of these names here are monoclonal antibodies that recognize specific epitopes in different parts of the protein. You can see the vast majority of them recognize the receptor binding domain of spike. That's the part of the spike that attaches to the receptor. So that's why I say most of the neutralizing antibodies for SARS-CoV-2 block attachment. They're all binding to this receptor binding domain. But there are still other epitopes throughout the spike, you can see them by the colors here, that um, are, are not binding the receptor binding domain. Uh, and they, they can neutralize infectivity as well by different mechanisms. And poliovirus is shown here bound to one monoclonal antibody that recognizes one site around that five-fold axis that I just showed you. And you can see five copies. Those purple masses are antibody molecules, and there are five of them binding at each five-fold axis because that's what icosahedral symmetry predicts, right? That around each five-fold axis, there are five copies of whatever sequence, and an epitope is going to be uh, five copies as well. Okay, so that's all neutralizing antibodies, but a lot of antibodies don't neutralize infection, they don't block infection, but they work in other ways to limit infection. And let me give you a couple examples of that. So here's one called antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity, or ADCC. Here we have uh, antibodies to a spike protein of a virus. So the antibodies are the blue guys here, and the spike proteins of the virus are being displayed on a virus infected cell, right? Before the virus particle buds from the plasma membrane, the, the spike proteins are in the membrane. So these antibodies can bind those spike proteins. And then an NK cell has receptors for this FC portion of the antibody. Remember the Y part, the upper part of the antibody binds antigen. The bottom part, the constant part, is the part that can bind FC receptors on cells like NK cell. So this NK cell now recognizes uh, 
that antibodies are bound to uh, this particular cell, and that sends a signal to the NK cell to release materials that will kill or induce apoptosis in this cell. So it's recognized as virus infected by virtue of these antibody interactions, and that cell is killed. These are not neutralizing antibodies, right? Alone, they will not block infection of cells by a virus, but they will lead to the killing of a virus infected cell, which can also have a positive effect uh, during an infection. Here's another way that non-neutralizing antibodies can clear an infection. In this case, we have, say, a, a phagocytic cell, say a macrophage. It has also FC receptors on its surface. And in this case, these FC receptors are engaging antibodies that are in turn bound to virus particles. So the blue guys there are virus particles attached to antibodies. The FC portion is binding receptors on the cell surface. They're taken up by endocytosis and they're degraded in the lysosome. So it's another way of antibody leading to destruction uh, of virus particles. And one more example, which I think is, is pretty cool. This is called netosis. This is where neutrophils throw out nets made of DNA to capture virus particles. And typically this happens when an, anti when an IgA antibody is bound to the virus. It's detected by the neutrophil. They throw out these nets to, uh, to capture more uh, virus particles and it involves uh, FC receptors. So it traps, traps the viruses so they can no longer move around. And this is also effective because if you get rid of this mechanism, it increases pathogenesis. Right, so in all these cases that I've talked about where antibodies are binding virus particles or components of them, there's, there's always mechanisms of evasion. Just like last time we talked about evasion of innate and intrinsic mechanisms, there's evasion of antibody as well. And here are three examples. Rhinoviruses exist as 100 different viruses circulating at the same time. We call them serotypes, but not an accurate name anymore, but that's just how they were originally described by, say, take serotype one, make antibodies against it, and showing that those antibodies will not prevent disease caused by, say, serotype two. So you get infected with rhinovirus 90 this winter, you get a little cold, and then next winter you encounter serotype 42, and you don't have protection against 42, so you get another cold. And so you, with over 100 serotypes, you can get a cold a year, at least a rhinovirus cold. So that's evasion of antibody. In the middle, we have the HA of influenza. Remember, those are the, that's the HA, those are the antigenic sites that give rise to neutralizing antibodies. They change every year. One amino acid change in each of those is enough to prevent the antibody from binding. And that's called antigenic variation. And one amino acid change in one of those epitopes is enough to make the flu vaccine not work very well from year to year. And we saw the same happening with SARS-CoV-2 antigenic variation extensively in the spike. All of those letters are amino acid changes throughout the spike that evade antibody binding. We had no idea that coronaviruses, of which SARS-CoV-2 is, is a member, could do antigenic variation. People said, no, nah, coronaviruses don't do this because nobody ever looked. And then when we did look, we see massive antigenic variation. That's, what, that's the major reason why each of these variants takes hold because they are immune evasive, they've made antibodies. Next question is, which statement about antiviral antibodies is incorrect? They are important for protection against viral infections. They only neutralize virus infectivity. They may block virus attachment to cells. They can be found at mucosal surfaces. IgM is the first to appear, then IgG. So which one is wrong? Yeah, I see. <laughs> but it's close, but close. Most of you got, they only neutralize virus infectivity, right? I said, quite a few times that um, there are non-neutralizing mechanisms like the NK cells and the netosis and so forth. 
So they can be found in mucosal surfaces. Sure, IgA is, is found, even IgM. Just, just think about this. You get a, a COVID vaccine in your arm, right? You're protected in your respiratory tract. So the antibody has to go into from the serum to the respiratory tract. We do the same with influenza, with respiratory syncytial virus. IgM is the first to appear, then IgG. That's absolutely right. There's a, there's a slide showing that. Okay. Yeah, good. You have plenty of chances left. All right. So we talked about antibodies. Yes. So the question is, why would you use an antibody uh, as opposed to an antiviral when you don't have an antiviral? So we had, as soon as there were recovered patients, we had antibodies. And, um, but we didn't have antivirals until the end of 2020, basically. So before that, we would use antibody therapy. And, and even, um, uh, also you could give antibodies prophylactically to prevent infection, which you don't do with an antiviral. Antiviral is just therapeutic. So if you have both, you can use the antibody to prevent, and then if you still got infected, you could use the antiviral. Right now, no monoclonal is used because there's resistance to all of them. And the convalescent serum is just used for immunocompromised patients. Okay, so let's talk about cell-mediated immunity. This is the part carried out by cytotoxic T lymphocytes. And so this, we think, is essential for preventing severe disease and clearing most virus infections. And what happens is the cytotoxic T lymphocytes, so this is now a CD8 positive cell, different from the T helper cell. This cell uh, forms a synapse with a virus infected cell and it induces lysis or induction of uh, apoptosis in the virus infected cell. And so basically the CD8 positive cytotoxic T lymphocyte has a T cell receptor. It will recognize a virus infected cell by virtue of having peptides displayed on MHC1 now, not MHC2 is for antigen presenting cells. Mm -hmm. And if that peptide is detected, then the T cell secretes perforin and granzyme B, which induce uh, apoptosis. And of course, viruses have evolved countermeasures, which we'll talk about as well. So this involves endogenous antigen presentation via MHC1, which is present on all cells, because all of the cells in you are potentially infectable, and so they need to have a defense mechanism. And so here, it's endogenous because this is an infected cell, and the infected cell is making viral proteins, shown here on the upper left. Those, some of those are degraded by the proteasome, so the proteasome is a very large protease complex in cells that chops up proteins into peptides that can be loaded onto MHC. And these peptides are transported into the ER by a protein, a peptide transporter. They're loaded onto MHC1, and then the MHC1 peptide is transported to the surface where it can then be presented to a CTL. So if this is an infected cell, it is an infected cell, it now the CTL can see that it's infected by this peptide on the surface and it will kill it. Viruses, of course, have countermeasures. Oh, by the way, so here's a, a cartoon of the peptide in the, in the MHC1 groove. And there on the right is the actual three-dimensional structure of the peptide in blue bound to the very tip of the MHC1 molecule. It's just beautiful how you have these, this platform made of beta strands and then two alpha helices. It's like a hot dog bun in a hot dog, right? It just fits in it perfectly. So viruses encode countermeasures, of course, because this can eliminate a virus infection. And um, ma many of these are herpes viruses because they, well, they, they tend to cause persistent infections, so they antagonize the clearance. Uh, and so each of these red circles is a point at which a herpes virus encodes a product that will inhibit some part of this endogenous presentation. Like they can inhibit the proteasome from chopping up the protein. They can inhibit the transporter of the peptide. They can inhibit the transport of the, of the MHC peptide to the plasma membrane. And they can also cause downregulation of the MHC peptide and send it to a lysosome where it's degraded. So all of these prevent uh, the presentation of the peptide on the cell surface. And then the cell can't be found can't be detected as being virus infected. So it evades T cell immunity. This happens quite often with uh, a lot of viruses. Uh, 
Here's a detail of this lysis of infected cells by uh, CTLs. So there's, the, again, the same picture on the right I showed you before. The CTL is engaging the infected cell via the T cell receptor. Then the, the CTL is making perforin and granzyme B. So perforin is the long purple molecules. It makes a pore in the plasma membrane. And that basically makes the cell permeable, which is not good. And then granzyme is a protein that goes through the pore and activates apoptosis. So granzyme will turn on the apoptotic pathway and then the cell apoptosis. So those two proteins are very important for this cytotoxic T lymphocyte response. As I mentioned, there are multiple ways of countering MHC1. I showed you a picture with red circles, but this is a listing of them. Uh, the, the, path, the part of the pathway that is inhibited and the viral protein. You just can see that everything is a target. The synthesis of MHC1, the synthesis of the transporter that brings the peptides into the ER, the function, the transporting function of the transporter, uh, transport of MHC1 to the plasma membrane. Sometimes the protein will cause MHC1 to be retained or dislocated to the cytoplasm where it can't reach the plasma membrane or endocytosis, as I told you. So every step of this endogenous presentation is a target for uh, antagonism by a viral protein. So we've talked about antibodies and CTLs, right? So which are more important for disease? Well, it depends on the virus. So here's an experiment with Mpox virus where we uh, vaccinate animals, experimental animals, and then we do some kind of immune manipulation. Either none, we deplete B cells, or we deplete CD8 T cells. Uh, and then we measure neutralizing antibodies, we infect the animals, and we look at the outcome. So when you do nothing, you get neutralizing antibodies three weeks after infection, you, you infect on day 28, and the, the animals are all protected. So you've basically vaccinated them against Mpox. Next row, we've depleted B cells. You see you, you really reduce the antibody titer, and three out of the four animals die. And if you deplete T cells, you get all survivors. You get high antibody titer and um, you get protection again. So in this case, protection against this fatal disease is mediated uh, by, by B cells. But you can find viruses for which it's the opposite. It depends on the particular virus and you have to do the experiment to figure it out. So far, we don't know what mediates protection against disease with SARS-CoV-2. You know, the vaccines induce both antibodies and T cells. And so it's likely that the T cells have a big role in preventing severe disease, but experimentally it's hard to do in people, right? You can only do correlations, but we'll talk more about that later. For some infections, the CTL response is more important. For some, the antibody response is more important. So how do, how does, how do our immune systems make the right decision? Well, it starts here in the lymph node when the sentinel cells bring in the antigen and it interacts with the T cells as we've described. And it is in the form of peptides and cytokines that are exchanged. So remember the, the T helper cells in the lymph node contact the sentinel cells, which present a peptide. The sentinel cells not only present the peptide, but they're also making cytokines. And those cytokines can determine whether you get antibodies made or T cells made. So the cytokines produced by the sentinel cells as well as the nature of the peptide. So here are some examples of this. We have a naive CD4 helper cell here. And if it gets IL-12 from the sentinel cell, it's gonna become a Th1 cell, which helps to make more cytotoxic T lymphocytes. If it makes IL-6, it's gonna become what's called the Th17 cells, which uh, helper cell, which is involved in tumor immunity and other uh, other activities. Um, when it gets IL, when it makes IL four, it's going to become a Th two cell, which helps to make antibodies. And then there's retinoic acid as as one of the secreted chemicals, which will uh, make it become a regulatory T cell. So the difference between CTL and antibody depends on the cytokines uh, that are produced. And so here, for example, is a 
uh, a, a macrophage or a dendritic cell that is producing IL-12, and IL-12 is going to bias it to a Th1 response. So you get mostly uh, CD4 cells and, and less of an antibody response. But you know, it's never all or none. There's always a mix. It's a matter of what predominates. Final question for today. Uh, for some infections, CTLs are more important for protection than antibody. How is the CTL antibody balance determined? By toll-like receptors, by intrinsic defenses, by autophagy, autophagy of infected cells, by the mix of peptides and cytokines presented by dendritic cells. It depends on whether the capsid is icosahedral or helical. Okay, let's check it out. Uh. Oh. So close, <laughs> and it was that last two. <laughs> anyway, uh, most of you got it. It's the mix of peptides and cytokines. The capsid doesn't really matter. I'm, I'm sure I didn't mention that at all in this lecture. But you know, I think someone is just doing it on purpose to, to spoil. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's my guess. Someone wants to be a spoiler because there's no identification of who it is, right? All right, the last thing we're going to talk about is memory. Uh, these adaptive responses are unique because they provide memory. So, in other words, if you are infected, if you're vaccinated for flu and then you get infected with flu, you're going to have a rapid and specific response. So all that B cell rearrangement and somatic mutation, you don't have to do it again because you store that final cell as a memory cell. And it lasts for many years in you and they can self-renew, all right? That's the key here. Does anyone get this picture? I don't know if any of you. The persistence of memory by Salvador Dali, okay? And notice there are viruses. Someone added viruses to them, yeah the persistence of memory. Um, so that's why we vaccinate, because you get memory. There's some, all those T cells, and B cells too exist as memory. We remember, remember every T cell has a different T cell receptor that resp remembers one peptide. You don't have to reamplify all those. You're gonna keep that one so you can amplify that specifically. Okay, uh, here's an interesting, the first evidence that infection provides immune memory before we had vaccines. This is, a, is an uh, epidemiological study in the Faroe Islands, which you can see are, are north of the UK there. And in 1781, there was an outbreak of measles in these islands. And for the next 65 years, there, was, there were, was no measles. Now remember, there's no planes flying every day to the Faroe Islands in 1781. There's a boat going there probably once a year uh, and so there's no measles virus imported, but still there's no measles for 65 years. And then in 1846, there's another, another outbreak of measles. So, by, so now we have a buildup of new kids who are susceptible to infection. And everyone who survived the original outbreak uh, in 1781, some of them were still alive, um, they don't get measles. So evidence that memory can last a long time without re-exposure to virus because these people didn't see virus very often because they were an isolated island population. That's the whole point here. So again, this is because of memory. When we first immunize, we have a, a response of B and T cells within two weeks or so, which contracts, because you don't wanna keep all those extra T cells and antibodies around. And then when you have a reinfection, you have a rapid response of B and T cells, and you have a mild infection as a consequence. This doesn't happen in everyone. Everybody is, every one of you is genetically different and you respond to infections in different ways. So you may be 25 years old and get, even after getting vaccinated, you get severe influenza maybe, right? And that could be due to your differences in your immune responses. But in a population level, this is what we see, mild disease, if you have a good, uh, memory. And what makes good memory is, is hard to know. Not every vaccine does it, apparently. Whether COVID vaccines are going to give us good long-term memory, it's only been a couple of years. We're going to have to wait to find out. So memory can be in the form of memory B cells. So they persist in the spleen and lymph nodes. 
And they are copies of those final high affinity pr antibody producing B cells. So you don't have to go through all of that again. And they don't make antibodies unless they see antigen again. So they're sitting in lymph nodes. And if you get infected, the antigen is gonna flow into the lymph node. They're gonna see it and boom, they start proliferating very rapidly into plasma cells and make uh, antibody. You can also have long lived plasma cells. These, these special uh, antibody producing factories, they can also persist in the, in the bone marrow. And we have memory T cells, which we'll talk about in a moment. But here's an interesting table where they have measured antibodies against different viruses to see how long after infection you can detect those antibodies. So when you take a serum from a person and measure antibodies, you're actually, it's a surrogate for memory B cells because if, if you have antibody 50 years after infection, that's made by memory cells. It's not antibody that lasted for 50 years. They don't last that long. Antibodies don't last more than a couple of months. So here, for example, there are two classes of um, infections. There are systemic infections where the virus is everywhere, including the blood. And then there are mucosal only infections like coronaviruses, flu, RSV, gastroenteritis. Those are very short persistence of antibodies. So the implication is memory is, is short lived. And so we'll see how long memory to SARS-CoV-2 lasts. But on the top, these are viruses that infect many tissues. They have a blood phase. And look, 75 years uh, antibodies can be detected in some people who have been infected with vaccinia virus. 40 years for smallpox, 75 years for yellow fever. So this is telling us that in some cases, memory B cells can last many, many decades, but not for some reason, not in mucosal infections, and we don't know why. One of the things, one of the ideas I have is that when you have a mucosal infection, it's mostly a few lymph nodes that are sampling antigen. And when you have a systemic, you have all the lymph nodes in your body that are sampling. So maybe you have a better chance of making better B cells, but I don't know if that's right. So this is what T cells and T cell diversity looks like. When you have an infection, you have increases in the numbers of T cells, as I've just told you. You have effector cells, which are like the cytotoxic T cells. They do something, they kill infected cells. So that's what we mean by effector cells. Most of them are terminal effector cells that eventually die. But then you have a mix of memory cells that live a long time and they reflect the specificity of the effector T cells. And you have what are called effector memory cells which circulate around you. And if there's an infection, they will home in on it and, and uh, do their thing. You have central memory T cells, which reside in the lymphoid organs, the, the lymph nodes and the spleen. And then you have resident memory T cells, TRMs. These are in the organ that was infected and they stay there. So if you have a lung infection with flu, you make T resident memory cells that stay there and respond later. And that's exactly where you want them, right? You don't want them coming from somewhere else. So these are really important. And knowing how to make those uh, from a vaccine is, is really important. And so you, know, you see, notice the numbers are contracting. It's the same thing with antibodies. You don't keep high levels of these T cells around because you would be chock full of T cells and you wouldn't be able to function. All right. So now you know all about immune responses, at least what you need to understand uh, about how viruses cause disease, which we will talk about after spring break. Have a good time.